If you're wondering why you can't seem to save as much money as you believe you should, cognitive biases could be a contributing factor. These biases are tendencies or habits that lead us away from making rational judgments in certain situations. They're often predictable and represent recurring deviations in our logical decision-making processes. Today I'll discuss a few specific cognitive biases that I've observed and fallen prey to that have caused me to spend more money and therefore save less. I'll be talking about the sunk cost fallacy, the angering bias, and the bandwagon effect. By the way, my name is Carly. I used to work in tech. I've since stepped away, and now I focus on modeling and creating videos. On this channel, I share videos around personal finance. I talk about my experiences in the modeling industry, and I also share videos on living intentionally. So if you're interested in any of these types of videos, please like and subscribe to this channel and ring the notification bell so you don't miss any of my videos. My first point is to observe where in your life the sunk cost fallacy is operating. This is a phenomenon where we might continue to invest resources into a project or decision despite the costs already incurred, even when giving up is clearly a better idea. The resources we're investing might include time, money, or effort. One example of the sunk cost fallacy related to overspending involves non-refundable deposits. If we pay for a non-refundable deposit, but we find later that we no longer want the service or the experience, we might still pay the rest of the cost of the service and just follow through with it simply because we already put down the non-refundable deposit. Because we're so averse to loss, we often pay the remaining cost of a service instead of recognizing the deposit as a sunk cost, which ultimately causes us to lose more money and maybe time and energy too. I also think about the sunk cost fallacy when buying an item or service that requires a regular maintenance and continuing to pay for the maintenance simply because we bought the item and we have it already. I think one specific example of this is around personal grooming. Eyelash extensions are quite popular. And for the record, I think we should do whatever we want that makes us feel most confident and comfortable. I think of eyelash extensions because they have an upfront cost, but on a monthly basis require maintenance for upkeep. If we pay for the maintenance only because we already have extensions and we're quite impartial about the look, then I think we're caught in the trap of the sunk cost fallacy. And finally, another example of a sunk cost fallacy might be holding onto stocks we purchased even beyond the point where it continues to make sense. We might continue to invest in a stock that has significantly depreciated, hoping to recover our initial investment. But realistically, we may never recover our initial investment, at least not while we remain invested in that stock. Part of this thought process involves emotional attachment to stocks, especially those purchased at higher prices. This attachment can lead us to hold onto individual stocks longer than we should, instead of selling and reallocating funds to better investments. I think this scenario aligns quite well with the endowment effect where an investor perceives the stock as valuable simply because they own it. And this combined with the sunk cost fallacy leads them to keep a depreciating stock due to the significant amount of money already invested into it. And then this behavior persists even when selling the stock and reallocating the funds would be more financially prudent. Many of us fall prey to the sunk cost fallacy because we're so focused on loss aversion. This can cause us to spend much more money than we urge expect to spend. But also catching ourselves falling prey to the sunk cost fallacy might not happen on a regular basis. Maybe it happens only a few times a year, but next time you paid for something because you already paid for part of it, think about whether you truly want to purchase it or if you're just trying to avoid losses. If you continue paying for something or doing something because you have already invested so much into it, then think about giving yourself permission to walk away. Anytime I regret one of my decisions, I always remind myself that I know I made the best decision at the time with the information that I had at that time. And with hindsight, maybe it no longer is the best decision, but I was always looking out for myself at that time. Anchoring bias influences us to spend more money because we rely heavily on an initial piece of information and we use that as our reference point when we make financial decisions. Most commonly, we might see this in negotiations. If we're a buyer, we might anchor our initial offers quite low. And if we're a seller, we might anchor higher. And once an anchor is set, negotiators tend to adjust their offers and counter offers relative to that initial point. Sales often use the anchoring bias extensively. Companies often use anchoring bias to their advantage by setting higher initial prices as the anchor points for a product or service. For example, a company might mark a jacket at $200 and this initial price serves as a reference point that influences how consumers perceive not just the price, but also the value and the worth of the item being sold. And then during a sale, 
let's call it Black Friday, the brand might mark the jacket at 50% off and consumers think that they're getting a great deal purchasing this jacket for $100 instead of $200. In reality, the sale price might have been how the company would have originally priced the item and maybe the market value of the jacket is actually lower if you do the research. Running a promotion influences people to purchase the item more, especially, especially if it's a limited time promotion. Free trials for subscription services also use anchoring bias as a tool to suck customers in. We might get free trials followed by a discounted first month or first three months of our service. When we're anchored on the initial free trial or discounted rate, it influences us to continue our subscription beyond the promotional period because of the perceived value established during the initial offer. Being aware of the anchoring bias helps us recognize the tactics companies use to encourage purchases. While sales can provide value if we genuinely need these items, I think understanding the angering bias allows us to see these strategies for what they are, which are techniques to influence our buying decisions. And quite frankly, the anchoring bias does work on me. When I look at buying items, I like to buy the best quality item and maintain it well. And sometimes these items are more expensive because they're arguably higher quality. And I do fall into the trap of thinking that the more expensive something is, the better quality it is, which isn't always the case. In each of these examples, anchoring bias demonstrates how Initial information or pricing can quite significantly influence our subsequent decisions and the perceptions of value and willingness to pay. When we're aware of anchoring bias, we can make more informed decisions by actually critically evaluating initial anchors and consider our broader contexts and alternatives before we finalize our choices. The bandwagon effect is a cognitive bias where individuals adopt certain behaviors, beliefs, or trends simply because others are doing so. They might not be making independent decisions based on their own preferences or evaluations. The more we spend because we see other people emulating certain looks or partaking in certain experiences, the less we are able to save. Part of what feeds into this is a phenomenon called social proof. When we see other people purchasing or endorsing a particular product, maybe it's a brand or like a lifestyle, we may feel pressure to conform or fit in with these social norms. And that can lead us to increase our spending on items that are popular or trendy, even if they don't necessarily align with our personal needs or values. I think the bandwagon effect particularly capitalizes on FOMO, where we are socialized to fear missing out on experiences, opportunities, or even status associated with owning or participating in certain popular trends. Then this fear can drive impulsive spending to avoid feeling left out or behind. Adopting popular trends or purchasing certain items can also enhance perceived social status or acceptance among peers. Maybe we spend more on luxury goods, branded items, or experiences that signal affiliation with a particular group or lifestyle. And because of that, we are reinforcing our identity or image. If you come to New York and explore the different neighborhoods, I really feel like each neighborhood has a uniform or like a specific fashion look. And it's really interesting to observe how these looks evolve from neighborhood to neighborhood. Overall, the bandwagon effect influences spending by shaping consumer perceptions, motivations, and behaviors around social conformity, and also the desire to avoid missing out on popular trends or opportunities. I think awareness of this bias can help us make more deliberate spending decisions based on personal preferences, needs, and our long-term financial goals. There are a number of ways we as individuals are influenced to spend money. The sunk cost fallacy is one where we might continue spending money in a certain way because of costs already incurred, even when giving up is clearly a better idea. Anchoring bias tells us that the first piece of information we see is our reference point in making financial decisions. Once an anchor is set, negotiators tend to adjust their offers and counter offers relative to that initial point. And finally, the bandwagon effect says that we may adopt certain behaviors, beliefs, or trends simply because other people are doing so. And we think if everyone is doing it, there must be some sort of merit to the trend. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. And you might also enjoy this video where I explain what a sinking fund is and why that is so important.